Thank you. Wow, there's a lot of stuff here. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Um, as just said, my name is Magda. I'm heading data solutions uh, team at the BBC. And I'm here with Clara, and we're going to be taking you on a journey of our kind of a project development and, um, and um, kind of a growth of the team um, as well. So this is how BBC looks like in my head. Um, it's big and weird. And uh, it's big because it has quite a lot of stuff going on. So there is um, obviously probably most of, of you are familiar with some of the content. So there is iPlayer, uh, there's sounds, there is BBC News, uh, there is loads of channels and there is loads of radios and so on. And I think every single person, especially people who are growing up in the UK, know BBC very well. Uh, it's also huge because there is loads and loads of journalists and loads of people who are creating content and so on. So overall, we employ about 20,000 people who are geographically spread and um, and work on different things. So uh, it is huge and it is weird um, uh, for, uh, for all those reasons. Um, it is also quite a... A pleasure and a privilege really to work for the BBC and there is few reasons that I'm going to try and explain to um, to kind of a, draw a picture of why um, why is that the case. Um, so first of all there is this public remit. Um, so we are funded by um, you. Uh, we are funded by TV license uh, and um, that gives us a uh, public remit uh, which means that um, our ambition is to uh, provide value to everyone. Um, it's not only about advertisers, it's not only about a segment of people, it's about everybody in the UK. So we care about people and that kind of a, gives us quite a lot of challenges when it comes to uh, doing data or building anything within the BBC, but it also uh, is that kind of a, something that drives our passion and, and, and drives uh, purpose. Um, it's also all about transformation and this kind of a weird big monster, uh, it's quite a um, challenging, but it's uh, something that is continuously transforming and luckily, um, and I think interestingly for us, we are in the middle of that transformation because uh, data is part of um, what it's known as the driver for uh, the digital future and, and transformation. So it's a really exciting time to, to be at the Beep. Um, scale, I discussed the scale. There's also scale on the audience side. So every day we have 10 million uh, people visiting BBC News website. Overall, when you think about overall BBC, we're bigger than Twitter. Uh, and that's quite impressive when you think about building anything at the BBC. So if you build recommenders or if you build any, um, you know, if you build apps, um, or any other solutions, it is big. It has huge impact uh, on the on the public and also uh, smart people. Uh, I mean, it costs quite um, a lot of uh, brain power to um, to to power this monster. And and I think uh, everybody would agree who ever interacted uh, with with people that, that there is a lot of there is a lot of uh, smart smart people, and that's quite inspiring. And um, uh, it's a really good. Uh, you know, good good to interact with uh, with uh, uh, everyone there. So um, we are here uh, today uh, to tell you a story about uh, developing a portfolio of solutions, um, and um, that portfolio of solutions of solutions wouldn't happen if it wasn't for the right team behind this, and also most importantly, really. Uh, from the growth perspective is without a demand uh, for the products within the organization. So um, there is a demand, the way we define it is the interest and the buying and the adoption of the solutions that we, uh, that we, that we build. So the way it started, it started with this craziness of our boss uh, tweeting about uh, engineers sit, sitting in the newsroom. Um, so these two guys are um, people behind a first uh, data uh, tool provided or built by this team. Um, and it was very much focused on one specific problem. So journalists at BBC News didn't really have knowledge or understanding of what is happening with the content after they published it. So the tool that was built is called uh, BBC, um, no, it's called Telescope. Um, and I am now going to attempt to 
uh, demonstrate or to demo it. We always know that demo is always working in presentations, so that's going to be great. So this is how telescope looks like. Um, it's basically a reporting tool uh, that shows at every single um, moment what are the most popular stories. So for example, um, we have, uh, yeah, the top ones are probably super complicated, so I'm not going to go there, but okay, we have Skywalker, that seems easier. Um, oops. So if you go into uh, more, oops, uh, if you go into more um, uh, detail, the the real cool thing about telescope is the fact that it gives like really actionable um, data points to the journalists. So um, very quickly after they publish something, they know uh, what is the traffic around uh, the um, content. So in this example here, um, uh, quite a lot of page views. Um, we also see that uh, actually. Most of the traffic is coming from the BBC, which probably means that the content was published on the index page, so lots of people went there. It's not very well search optimized, uh, not really much traffic from social media. And actually, those points are quite um, interesting from the journalist perspective, because the way we explain how they can use those data points is like tabs. Um, so looking at search, looking at social, looking at index page, um, if the performance is not really great, they can open that tab and they can do something about it. So they can post the article on social media and so on. So it's all about informing that kind of like immediate action after publication uh, with the real-time data. So Telescope, again, when you think about it, this is not a super complicated thing, right? This is reporting, it's real time, it's fast, it looks great, it kind of it delivers what the journalist wants, uh, but it's not really kind of like specifically super science-y uh, in, 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 um, in those terms. But what happened with Telescope was that it had a quite a steep curve of adoption. So um, this is last few months, well, actually last year's few months of um, number of page views on the tool uh, by journalists, which means that um, we kind of reached a milestone, milestone of 100,000 uh, page views uh, of the telescope uh, in a month, which means that every single journalist um, uses telescope about 49 times a month. That's a lot for a journalist. Like looking at data from the content creator perspective, it's quite, uh, quite a lot of um, times they interact with the tool. Um, the challenge was that when we um, build a tool and it became quite popular, it kind of got stuck at some stage. Uh, and it got stuck because there was not really much people behind it. There was no more than those two or, or three engineers behind the tool. Um, so what we needed to think about is like, how do we expand the function? How do we expand the team in order to support the growth of this tool and other tools? Um, and this is what our team was kind of a, from the beginning quite good at, is identifying business problems that can be solved with um, uh, with data applications. Um, so we know that about 60% of our audience are one-hit wonders, uh, which means that um, uh, they come to the website and don't really engage with the content. That's a standard problem that publishers or any content providers have. Is people just don't engage uh, with the content. We also know that there is a quite a standard and well discussed in, in the industry solution to this, and this is um, recommenders. This is the same room last year. Uh, we were talking with Jeremy, um, who is the engineering manager. We're talking and describing a bit more details about the recommendation engines that we have built. Um, focusing first on the World Service websites, but basically sticking recommended articles on the article page to enable onward journeys. So not, not gonna go into too much detail, but I'm just gonna say that what it did to our team is that it provided that project um, that was, I call it normal, because we had a problem, we had a solution, and we could, the adoption and the demand of, of that project was, uh, was growing in a stable way, and that allowed us to build a business case to hire more people and to support that project. Uh, and it allowed us to hire you know, smart people like Clara and other in, um, engineers and data scientists to continue developing the project. Not without a challenge, because we uh, faced a lot of uh, challenges around, for example, metadata um, of the content 
content uh, that we couldn't quite um, um, uh, get to the right quality and we had to come up with different ways of addressing this and that's something that Clara is going to talk a little bit more about uh, in terms of how did we overcome the challenge with lack of um, metadata about the content. Over to you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so when we started working with recommenders and thinking of building recommenders at BBC, we decided to start simple. Um, so we focused on content similarity recommenders. So if a user comes to the BBC and is reading something about uh, climate change or a new algorithm that is uh, performing better to diagnose cancer, we would like to serve them or recommend them more articles uh, that are related to that topic or topics. So the first challenge that we have here is how do we translate our content or our articles that are text-based into a numerical representation presentation or what we call big, uh, content ve vectors um, in order to use maths and metrics that allows us to calculate uh, the similarity between articles. Um, so we investigated several... Uh, what? This is groundbreaking. Okay. okay. Um, so we started investigating uh, several algorithms like, for example, FastText, which, which is an algorithm developed by Facebook, which does word uh, embedding in texts. And one of the reasons why we didn't end up using it is because so they have pre-trained models for different languages. And in BBC, we are aiming to uh, build recommenders for different languages. And they, they didn't have pre-trained models for all the languages that we needed to build um, and uh, we needed a common engineering infrastructure for this and another another reason is that we found that fast text was was a bit um, uh, obscure so difficult to explain and interpret and so in, in BBC we have agreed that we will um, build algorithms that uh, are that we can explain and that are interpretable so we can be transparent about what we build um, so then we, we decided to use a, an algorithm called LDA, Latent Dirich Late Allocation, which is a generative probabilistic model that what it does is it takes a text and it converts, um, it converts the text into a collection of topics or a probability distribution of the, that article to be about certain topics. So if we train the algorithm with um, a corpus of articles, then once the algorithm is trained, we can take any new article, I pass it through the model, and it will give us a, a probability distribution of topics, or we, what, we can, what we call now uh, content vectors. Um, but what's inside here? So there are two concepts in this algorithm that after being trained um, are important. That is the matrix of topics and the matrix of documents or articles. So each topic is uh, represented by a list of words that are more probable to appear um, in that topic. So this algorithm tries to uh, find uh, topics with any guidance uh, in the corpus of, of articles. Um, so based on those words, the articles will be translated into um, a probability of each article to be about certain topics. So for now, these topics are numbers and we, we don't know what they are about because in this case, for recommenders, we don't, uh, we don't mind. But what are the challenges of using this algorithm? Um, this algorithm is unsupervised, which means that it tries to find patterns in data without any guidance. It's not a, like a classification problem. So oh, this makes very difficult the selection of the hyperparameters. So depending on the values of the hyperparameters, the output of the algorithm is going to be different. So for example, the number of topics is here very important. And how can we define what is the number of topics that is optimal for our problem? So in our team, we decided we have defined different metrics and tests to come up with the best model uh, for our use case to build content similarity recommenders. And today I'm going to talk about uh, two um, tests that or metrics that we did 
which is how do we measure similarity between articles. And uh, also we were interested in knowing what is and evaluating the alignment between what the algorithm thinks is similar and what humans think is similar. And we did other tests that I won't explain today, but you can ask me later if you want. Um, so we took a data set of 70,000 articles that were published in one year in BB at BBC News. And uh, the, the language was English in this case. Um, so how do we measure similarity? We are, we, once we have represented our articles as a distribution of topics, we want to know uh, or have a metric ca that can lead us to find what articles are similar. So a, a metric that is... Um, useful to calculate the difference between this probability distribution and more importantly the information gain between articles is a metric called kullback leibler divergence so if we see these two articles and the topic distributions the kl divergence for is 6.7 which is quite high so we can think that these two articles are very dissimilar. So we wanted to kind of visualize the similarity space of the corpus of our articles. And what we did was to calculate pairwise distances between um, the pairs of articles in the corpus that we were handling. So here we can see that these pairs of articles are very similar and these uh, articles are very dissimilar. So we wanted to use this metric to actually find out what the number of topics, what the ideal number of topics was for our model. So we started taking extremes. Um, we selected 150 topics and 20 topics. So if we look at this uh, graph on the left, we see that there are many articles that are very uh, we, we can see that there are very few articles that are similar, but most of them are dissimilar. Um, so that is not ideal because we don't have enough uh, similar articles to, to recommend. If we take 20 topics, the similarity space is more homogeneous, so we have quite a lot of um, articles that are similar and also dissimilar. But then we can have a look at other um, histogram or other metric that we found that uh, using 20 topics, most of the articles were described by only two topics. So what means that 20 topics was a very, uh, very um, low number, and most of the articles were um, described by the same number of topics, which gave us very, like, um, not very good results. Uh, so then we restricted the, the search uh, to 50 and 30 topics. So here we see that the similarity space is more homogeneous, but still we cannot decide between 50 and 30 topics. So then we decided to uh, try another approach, which we called um, triangle tests, that is a human-centered uh, test. So we wanted to measure how aligned is uh, our similarity space or the similarity space uh, of the models uh, compared to what a human would understand as similar. So in this case, we, we asked 12 journalists to uh, answer some questions or, uh, or uh, ask them um, to reply to a, a test. And uh, how did we design this test? So we took several uh, reference articles and we plotted the KL divergence distribution, the metric, in comparison to the rest of the articles in the corpus. So then we can see that A2 is an article that is very similar to the reference, but A5 is very dissimilar. So we took combinations of, um, of these articles with the references, and then we asked the journalists to read them and tell us which ones they thought they were more similar. So this can be... Um, uh, one example, uh, as a reference, there is a, an article about Scotland that uh, it's been decided to, well, it's decided to um, create a research center of AI for health. And then we have uh, article A and article B, and article B, A is also about artificial intelligence and B is about politics. This is a very simple example, but actually in the in the, this is the test that we gave the, the journalists. So there are different combinations of articles with different levels of similarity. So they had to answer to this 
this um, this test, and then we compared the answers with what uh, the algorithms gave us in terms of the KL divergence uh, value. So we tried, uh, we compared it with the 30 topics model, 50 topics model, and 70 topics model. And so we can see that for the 50 topics, we had the highest alignment between human and uh, and the, the model, the LDA model. And we can also see that um, the, these are in the x-axis uh, are the, the number of respondents and the number of uh, answers that got um, um, aligned with the algorithm. So we see that for most of the users, the, um, the answer was um, um, similar to the one in, uh, re uh, given by the model. So this is actually the test that gave us the answer on deciding the number of, of topics in uh, for our recommender uh, for the English language. Um, so we re reproduced this process for other languages, and this is the result in the BBC News website for um, Spanish and uh, Hindi. Um, but recommenders can be amazing, but if we don't have the relevant content, we cannot reach our audiences and we cannot um, um, give them what they, what they want. So another um, a project that we worked in our team um, was um, to, um, we used uh, this model to um, um, profile use segment, segments of users in BBC. So we took uh, 65 million users that came to uh, the BBC in one week. Uh, we clustered them by behavior, by how they behaved in the web, and then we wanted to know if there were differences in content, in content, in what content they, they were interested in. So here our stakeholders were editors, so this was going, this give us give them feedback to what content to commission uh, but also to product managers on deciding what uh, what products can be built um, to um, make the service uh, better um, so using this the LDA algorithm um, before I was explaining that uh, there is a matrix of words, uh, but the, the, num the topics were just numbers. So in this case, we needed to interpret the topics. And we also worked with uh, journalists in interpreting these words that belong to each topic and what articles are assigned to each topic. And we gave them names. With those names, we were able to go back to the reading history of users and build uh, content, profi content profiles. Um, so with the with all this information, um, we could have we we got some insights. And uh, for example, we found that all ladies read about uh, Love Island and celebrities. And also, interestingly, young audiences are not interested in our content about uh, entertainment. They are not interested in in music and films, which is quite strange. So there is. This is here is there is some insight for editors to think a bit about what's not working there. Um, and also we found another segment that um, they were interested in Brexit, but they weren't interested at all in other uh, aspects of politics or economics or, or um, um, international politics, for example, which is also interesting. Um, and this leads us to the third project where we also used the uh, LDA model. So uh, when I'm talking about the LDA model, it is actually the trained model that we use for uh, recommenders. So it's the same trained algorithm. And in this case, uh, this project was a bit different. We were working with uh, researchers from the University of uh, Manchester. They were social scientists and uh, they were interested in understanding uh, on and studying political knowledge gaps in society. So there is the theory that uh, people with high levels of education are very engaged with politics and people with lower levels of education are less engaged in politics. So this this can lead to like an, a healthy society because there are people that are being left behind. Um, so we worked with them into uh, in a project where we wanted to see if there are patterns of behavior when people are consuming media that prove this theory. And um, we actually saw that um, yeah on the plot on the 
right. Uh, these are the different topic uh, interest of uh, users with high level of education and low level of education. This was just a pilot project, but we could uh, start uh, identifying these knowledge gaps. So this, is all, this was also important because uh, with these results we can start thinking in BBC how can we um, start uh, closing that, uh, uh, that gap between, uh, between these uh, people that are less and um, more engaged with politics. Like, for example, designing articles as explainers to uh, help people catch up with the latest uh, um, facts in politics. Um, yeah, so all, in all of these three projects, we have used the same algorithm, which uh, was based in the like, LDA topic modeling. And uh, that's what, why we call that this uh, project or the recommenders uh, turned out to be a blockbuster. Oh, yes. That's really smart, isn't it? Let, let's do a round of applause for Clara. <laughs> Thank you. Um, oh. Um, so, yeah, so as Clara said, this is a blockbuster project, and the reason why it's important is because that that first of all, it kind of uh, help us create more demand and more credibility within the business, and um, build up the team that has not only delivered a lot of science and a lot of insights, but also a solid software like recommenders and and telescope uh, that um, that kind of uh, created that credibility and let us think about. Um, uh, other things. What also we discovered in the whole process that Clara was describing, looking at segmentation and the, and the profiles, is that our distribution of the content is quite unbalanced. Um, so when we think about our, whether it's topics or generally the volume of content that is uh, targeted or is specifically of interest to different demographic groups, we see that uh, the kind of over 55s are um, kind of a dominant target for, uh, for our content. And even our approaches to entertainment or Love Island um, uh, haven't quite reached the young audiences um, as much as we maybe w wanted to. So there are two things that need to happen, uh, really, to address this. Um, one is we need to balance the distribution, um, so make sure that we equalize our production and we really, really create the content that is right for, uh, for young audiences, but also that we do it in, in a smart way, because we can't really reduce the number of content, because recommenders, as Clara said, it, they're not going to they're not going to really deliver uh, if there isn't enough uh, enough content. So those two things need to happen. We need to be more efficient in the way we produce, and we need to be more balanced uh, in terms of relevancy to the audience. So those numbers, surprisingly, are not how many votes Theresa May missed at the parliament. Um, but um, they are showing the scale of the um, the challenge, really. Um, so, a um, large amount of um, content that we produce every day, uh, many journalists or content creators working on, on it, and many, many decisions that are happening every single day. Uh, the reason why the content is not really balanced is because the decisions that we take are not necessarily always informed by the audience. Um, and those uh, three and a half thousand uh, decisions need to be informed by uh, by the audience um, and this is how kind of a, our thinking in terms of what we're doing next and how can we um, help BBC even more to uh, to be better in reaching the audiences uh, we went a little bit deeper into the workflow um, you might not always think about uh, content or creative content uh, uh, production as a, as a factory. Uh, it's not a line, but it kind of is a line yeah, in a way. There is always different stages of production. So there is planning, uh, there is the creation, then there is the publication, and then there is reaching the audiences and measuring the reactions from the audience. So understanding all those different stages helped us understand what are the decision points and this three and a half thousand decisions w at what point they happen and potentially what data points um, and what insights we need to deliver at every single stage um, and this is how the project called feedback loop and 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 then later an automation uh, has been born so we in order to address all those decisions we need scale it's not going to happen manually um, reports are great and uh, um, and insights are amazing, but 
uh, delivered in a manual fashion are not going to help us. We need to, to, do, to build a system that's going to be automated and it's going to be delivering uh, the right data points at the right uh, moment in time. Uh, and that system um, has to rely on uh, three principal data points. Um, um, and those data points, when we talk about data points, those are large, uh, large scale databases that are orientated around content data. So this is the metadata, like topics uh, generated by the LDA or vectors um, that Clara was describing. Uh, those are audience data that um, predominantly now telescope would be focused around because um, it's about giving the, the immediate feedback uh, after the publication. And then um, new uh, database or data set that we are uh, looking at now is the production data. So this should capture every stage of production so that we know at what point uh, what data is required by the, uh, by the journalists. So I hope this story kind of um, showed you that uh, there is a lot that science is doing in our team um, and it takes us forward uh, because it creates the demand. It, it shows the stakeholders that, um, uh, that that kind of intelligence about, about the audience, the intelligence about the, the production process. Uh, but is reality is that the software is the thing that is making the real impact. Uh, without telescope, uh, we wouldn't be uh, able to build up on that success without recommenders we wouldn't have credibility to um uh, to uh, think about uh, our next steps and how can we uh, make a deeper in impact um and i think this portfolio of projects let us um kind of we can now afford to focus on a slow burning uh, project so feedback loop is a slow burning project because we focus on building mvps and focus on building the the basics so the production data set uh, in order to um to deliver the um the broader um functionality of the system um so in summary growing the team um that's orientated on data solutions, um, it's about three things. It's about portfolio of projects. Um, it's about the team that supports it. Uh, but you can only build a team when you when you have the business case for it. Uh, and it's about the demand. And you can build a business case when you have a demand for uh, for your solutions. Um, so next year, this is going to happen. Uh, we're going to be talking about this amazing point where our feedback loop is, is all ready to go. Um, it's going to be uh, lots of interesting, uh, interesting projects around uh, around this one, and it all was just a giant recruitment pitch, uh, um, because uh, yes, we're not going to get to that point until we actually have more and more smart people. So those are all the open positions. Come to talk to us, email us, um, uh, reach out to us. Uh, if you don't want to join, uh, please don't be shy. Come and see us. We have a um, uh, machine learning fireside chats, uh, an event, uh, kind of a regular panel where uh, a lot of a lot of this uh, stuff is discussed. The next one is on the first of May. Uh, we also have a presence in Royal Statistical Society. Uh, it's a place where uh, you know it's an organization that really cares about making sure that data science is a profession and is industrialized and it's really uh, recognized as uh, as something that um, is is real and and is looked after um, from the professional perspective. Uh, also, don't forget, I know we have a really amazing balance here among speakers um, in terms of gender. This is amazing, but don't forget that we still have a lot of work to do in, in terms of the gender gap. And um, that's one of the initiatives that's really worth looking at. If you know some uh, a, a, a female leader who is really inspiring, uh, nominate her to uh, 20 in data. That's us. Thank you so much. Questions? Thanks. We've got about five minutes for questions, so um, I'll pass the mic back to Maud and Clara. They'll repeat the question for the benefit of, benefit of everybody. So I'll give you the mic.
thank you. So I, I hope I'll be able to re re reflect the question. Uh, it's about how do we enable discovery of the content that's relevant for young audiences if uh, they don't come in the first place to the site. Uh, is that the question? No. Okay, so it's more, right, right, yes, yes, yeah, so it's more about how do we differentiate uh, the experience uh, in relation to the content and not always recommend the same content more and more. Yeah, that's a very good question and actually uh, we had spent a lot of time thinking about this because this is one of the uh, many pitfalls of recommenders, um, so how uh, to prevent filter bubbles and, and echo chambers. Um, we are uh, thinking about the broader um, solution for that problem uh, and it's called public service algorithm, uh, which um, in its early forms, uh, looks at uh, measuring the negative impacts of recommenders. So we measure diversity, we measure uh, the serendipity, we measure the novelty of the content that we recommend in order to tweak the different uh, content that is that is displayed uh, to the user. Uh, we're also working closely with journalists who are writing up uh, the uh, editorial guidelines. Uh, it's it's kind of it's a general. Uh, very strongly um, looked after thing at the BBC. The, the editorial guidelines and uh, policy is is uh, something that is is very dominant in everything that we we do. Um, so there is level of business rules that go behind the recommenders that reflect that editorial guidelines uh, as well as the measurement. Uh, but yeah, it's it's one of the um, very kind of uh, interesting problems that. Uh, sorry, next question. Uh, so the question is about how, what uh, we use to incentivize the journalists to write the content for the audience. Is it becoming kind of a like more clickbaity because we tell them what is popular and therefore they create more of the stuff that is popular? Uh, yeah, it's it's a similar problem to. Is that reflecting your question? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, how do we um, how do we include um, the ethical challenges around uh, content production? Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. So it's all down to working with journalists uh, while we develop the product uh, as well. So, for example, our team sits in the newsroom uh, at the BBC, so that we, uh, I mean, there is no way they everywhere. Uh, uh, so we need we we have to work with them um, on on that. Um, the uh, the machine that is going to be um, recommending the content or uh, maybe alerting the journalist that there is something else that or some other angle or other topic that should be uh, written about in order to attract new audiences um, is, uh, uh, is, is only a part of the system. Uh, there is still an editorial judgment on the output of the machine and also I think we learned this in you know years of being in newsrooms and working uh, with with journalists that it is not only about what is the most popular. Um, it's there is other measurements of the quality. Uh, we always look at how content is popular among different segments, uh, the different demographics. Uh, what are the topics that um, are important from uh, you know that kind of a guidelines or the agenda for the for the journalists uh, and so on. So there is a lot of things that is taken into account when it comes to uh, uh, to that. Uh, yes, to add, so uh, in the case of the segmentation project, we use demographics to understand what the users want, but we never target users by demographics. It's just to, it's data informed, but not, in this case, not data driven. So we don't target by demographics. Yeah, uh, yeah. one more. Uh, so the question is about how do we improve the business case for some of those projects. Uh, 
yeah so it, it's a it, uh, it's a long topic <laughs> in itself uh the and it's case by 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 case you always start with the with the value that it's going to generate and the effort it's going to cost and um how iterative it's it's going to happen so um we start with a problem that we can solve quite locally. Um, so, for example, in news uh, on a smaller scale, um, how uh, building up recommenders is going to help driving more reach in, um, you know, in, in certain services. Um, An experiment with that, so we can collect data to then show that there has been a positive impact so that we can roll it out to more services. So it, it goes kind of a back and forth in uh, in, in iterations uh, in, in, in that way. And I think it's important to keep that uh, momentum going. So, um, you know, gain, build a business case around something smaller, achievable within X number of months, let's say it's six months, test it, come back with more data, ask for more money, come back with more data, ask for more money. Uh, it's an iterative process, but uh, I think it's a, it's a challenging uh, thing to do, especially in public service as well. Can I add something? Yeah. <laughs> yes, so also in our team, we have been like, uh, we are quite new, and we have been also showing uh, results to different type of people and uh, asking them, oh, would this be useful for you? Would this be useful for you? And then they actually come on board. And th that helps us also to define better the, the business case and also to build new projects. Uh, yeah, sorry. Get you. So we uh, one of the tests that we have done is we were actually um, concerned about the stability of the model through time. So we did one test that was, um, so with the LDA, you can uh, update the model with a new corpus of documents, uh, maintaining the same number of topics. So what we did was we trained the algorithm with one year of data. We updated the model with um, uh, articles from four months later. And then what we saw is that per topic, the percentage of articles assigned to each topic wasn't changing that much. So for that case, uh, we were we are happy with what we have now, but also because I think that uh, in BBC, it seems like we are like writing about the similar things over and over, which is, I think, something that we have to yeah, also uh, study. There are other ways of uh, looking at the stability of the model in LDA, which is there are some papers that focus on the perplexity, which is like how much the how the model is adapting to the corpus, and um, there are uh, some yeah some research on that, and you can actually track the perplexity these metrics through time, and when it drops, then you need to retrain the model, but we haven't done that yet. That's a, uh, yeah. So the question is about the cross-content recommendations between, for example, BBC News and sport or um, documentaries. We are thinking about this. It's not yet quite happening. Part of the problem is more organizational than the technical. So, you know, we kind of like, we lived in those silos. Uh, I think that's m part of that transformation uh, is bring it more together because exactly that's like a no brainer it is, you know, we have so much good content, we should recommend podcasts alongside articles and so on. So yes, yeah, absolutely. Thinking about this, yeah. I think we're going to have to uh, close the, the public question session. Um, we've got coffee until 11 o'clock. Can I just remind you that we have our sponsor booths at the back of the, the room. Please do visit them uh, and also take advantage of Code Nodes offerings. And we have a charity partner, Neat, who have a booth the other side who are supporting uh, wildlife uh, conservation in Namibia. But uh, we'll see you again at 11. Thank you.